Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Friday night, just before Halloween, uh, for our stargazing lecture here at Caltech Astronomy. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I will be your MC for this evening's event. And, uh, but first, a, a handful of announcements. So this is, as you probably know, this is a, an event that we host about once a month on Friday nights. Uh, it's uh, 30 minute presentation scientist here in the department, followed by um, kind of a broader astrophysics Q&A. So Dimitri and myself and a couple other members of the department will set up uh, a table up here afterwards and be happy to field from all of you. And also from we're, we're live broadcast right now on YouTube and on Facebook. Hello, online viewers. Um, so we'll take questions. And also during the this period, we'll have telescope uh, fields behind us. I think this microphone is going out. Um, telescopes, telescopes set up out there. Um, there are a number of awesome targets up right now. So Jupiter is visible, Saturn is visible, the the crescent moon is visible in our solar system. We also have some additional telescopes to look at things like the Ring Nebula, the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, and some deeper deeper targets in the sky. So I encourage you guys to check out what's out there, but also uh, you can go back and forth as, as you so desire to, to check out things in here and, and listen to the Q&A and vice versa. So um, our next one of these, I forget the exact date. I think it's December 2nd. Uh, we will hear from a uh, postdoctoral fellow in the department, Dr. Arena Butsky, who will be talking about kind of the atmospheres around galaxies, like around our Milky Way, and what sort of information we can find out from observational as well as theoretical studies of those. And in addition, we have a series of events called Astronomy on Tap. These take place at a lo local bar in Old Town, Pasadena. They happen, again, once a month, but they happen on Monday nights. And it's uh, it's it's an opportunity to go to a, a bar, a restaurant. It's an outdoor patio in Old Town and hear a couple of science talks from different scientists. It's less formal than being here at an academic institution, but it's still fun. It is open to all ages. Um, so so uh, people under the age of 21 are obviously allowed, but can cannot consume alcohol as the law prohibits. Uh, there's also live music, and we also set the telescopes up out there. And we finally, we have um, astronomy themed pub trivia with cool prizes. So it's, it's super fun. Our next one of those will be November 14th. And our speakers for that are actually in the back of the audience right now. Uh, Dr. Niels Deppa and Dr. Stephanie Deppa will be talking about, uh, I think black holes and, um, uh, observations of the solar system and kind of deep cosmology, the other parts of the universe from some upcoming telescopes. So should be really cool. Um, but if you check out our, our social media or our website or the calendar, you'll find out the updates and when those things are announced. Um, I think those are my announcements for now. So I will introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, our speaker hails originally from Belgium. He did his undergrad and PhD at the University of Liège. In, in Belgium before then doing work in Orsay and Moudon in Paris. Then he came here, he was at the Jet Propulsion Lab for several years before then, relocating to South America to Chile and working on the Very Large Telescope. That is not a fake name, that is a real name of a telescope, the VLT, the Very Large Telescope um, in Chile. It's amongst the largest telescopes in the world. It's appropriately named. And then he came back as a faculty member and has been a professor here in the department for the last seven, just over seven years now. Almost eight. Almost eight. Uh, and he primarily works on exoplanets, planets orbiting around other stars. And he's done some really um, formative work in instrument in building instruments to appropriately detect these things, including building the vector vortex coronagraph for blocking out light from the star so you can see the planet. And, and he's going to talk to us a bit about the search for Earth-like planets around other stars. So I please welcome Dr. Dimitri Mawe. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Caltech. Um, so 
Of course, uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have any questions. Uh, happy to answer. And then after the talk, uh, we'll have a, a Q&A. So um, if you want, you can also keep your questions for after uh, the presentation. So I'll be talking about uh, a subject that is uh, close to my heart and, and passion and a driver of my research and work, uh, which is to find another Earth. So the, the motivation for, for this is, uh, all right, uh, to answer or help answer uh, two age-old questions which have been in humans' mind for uh, a very long time. Uh, one can say millennia. Uh, where do we come from and are we alone? So now today, it's quite extraordinary to realize that we have the technologies and the understanding to try to answer these two questions in scientific terms. So the quest to answering this question starts uh, with uh, the detection of a planet outside the solar system, which is very recent. Uh, it happened roughly 25 years ago when a team of two Swiss astronomers pointed a, a telescope in France to a star to measure uh, the motion of the star along the line of sight and detected an anomaly there uh, that could only explain by the presence of a very massive planet orbiting the star in just a few days. So there was a lot of skepticism early on uh, following this discovery and the announcement of this discovery. But now this is regarded as the foundation of a new field in astronomy called exoplanet science. So just to summarize, an exoplanet is a planet that uh, is in orbit around the star other than the sun. So if you look at the night sky, you see thousands of stars. Well, you can be sure that almost all of them have planets orbiting around the star. So how many exactly do we know of today after 30 years or so of, a planet, of planet hunting? Well, you can check out the JPL and NASA websites, uh, which track in real time the status of this hunt. And as of a few days ago, uh, we've discovered more than 5,000 exoplanets of many different types. And I will describe some of these planet types that we've discovered, some of which do not exist in our solar system. Now, to discover all these planets, we've used a variety of techniques, including this technique that the two Swiss astronomers used uh, in the 90s. Uh, but one that is very close to my research and interest and that I've been working on for the past 20 years is trying to take pictures of these planets, a technique that we call direct imaging. So first, I want to say a few words about all the planet types that we know of today, some of which are in the solar system, others do not exist in our solar system. So I'll start with the gas giants. So they are roughly the size of Saturn or Jupiter. Um, and those include uh, the variety that we call the hot Jupiters, which happen to be extremely close to their star. So they are constantly radiated by their star, heating them up to thousands of degrees. And those planets are truly hot balls of fiery gas that orbit their star extremely fast and extremely close. So when we first discovered these hot Jupiters, that really put into question our understanding of how planets form, because all the theories of planet formation had been based up until then on the solar system and the eight planets and small bodies in the solar system. So how can a Jupiter-sized planet be that close to its star? For sure, these planets being mostly made out of gas, hydrogen, mostly, for sure, this planet cannot form that close to the star where the gas would be instantaneously vaporized, right? So one had to invoke mechanisms like migration theories where the planets form far away from the star and then migrate inwards by interacting with the primordial gas in the disk surrounding the star from which the planets accrete material and grow over time. So the second time of planet are Neptune-like planets which are the size of our own Neptune and Uranus. Those are made of mostly hydrogen and helium. But we found a particular type of Neptune-like planets that we call mini-Neptunes that are uh, about half the size of our own Neptune, 
and not found in our own solar system. Then we found planets that we think are super Earth, that are a bit larger than the Earth, roughly a factor of two or so. Um, and those, again, do not exist in our solar system. And finally, we found a lot of small planets. Those are terrestrial planets. They are roughly the size of the Earth, Venus, or Mars. Uh, they are most likely made of rock and metals. And they could eventually possess oceans, uh, atmospheres, and even perhaps some of them be habitable. So there is a tremendous variety of worlds out there, some of which do not exist in our solar system. So that really begs the question, how do planets form and do we really understand what is going on? So all these planets were found by a, a series of techniques, uh, some of which measure different aspects of a planet, different properties. So I'll talk about three main techniques. The first one, which by the numbers is the most successful so far, it's responsible for finding thousands of exoplanets, in particular thanks to a telescope that NASA launched uh, in the late 2000s called the Kepler mission. And the Kepler mission monitored uh, a field of about 150,000 stars for a few years with a cadence of a few minutes. And the Kepler mission looked for what we call the transit of a planet in front of the star. So let me illustrate this. So imagine a planet orbiting a star at the center. If by chance the plane of the orbital plane is aligned with the line of sight from, from Earth. And if the planet passes in front of the star, you will see a dimming of the light from the star that is periodic because the planet orbits you know, um, regularly around the star. It's, so if you measure this dimming happen several times, it can be interpreted as a planet passing in front of its star. And the amplitude of the dimming is a measure of the size of the planet. You can imagine that large planets will block out more light from the star and, in, and, and therefore induce a larger dimming of the, of the starlight. So this technique is very useful because it allows us to measure the size of planets if we know the size of the star. So the second technique is called the radial velocity technique. This is the second uh, most important technique by number, but historically the most important one, because that's the technique that enabled the discovery of the first exoplanet around a sun-like star. And here we again have a planet orbiting a star. And we oftentimes think of planet orbiting stars as the star being in the center of the system and the planets revolving around the star. But what is happening is actually both the planet and the star move around the center of mass of the system so that the star is actually also moving in response to the gravitational influence of the planet. And so the motion of the star can be measured very precisely with instruments on large ground-based telescopes that we look for the Doppler shift of the light from the star moving away from us. The star light will be shifted to the red and when the star moves towards us, the light will be shifted to the blues. This is akin to when you're in the street and there is an ambulance going by, you hear the pitch of the siren going up and down. This is the same effect on light. And we can measure that very precisely and therefore infer um, the mass of the planet. So the radial velocity technique measures the mass of the planet. Now, what's interesting is that for a few hundred cases, we have both uh, the planet transiting and we can also measure the radial velocity. So then now we have a measurement of the radius of the planet and the mass of the planet. So with the size and the mass, we can compute the density of the planet and infer its interior composition. Is it made of rock? Is it made of gas? We can say such things about these planets. But now that's pretty much all we can say about these planets when we use these two techniques. So now there's a, a third technique, the one that I've been working on for now a couple of decades, which is trying to take pictures of an exoplanet. Well, this is not easy because stars are extremely bright planets by definition, very faint because they are small, they don't emit much light at all. Um, and so they are hidden in the glare of the blinding starlight. And just to give you an order of magnitude, I'll come back to this, but the contrast ratio, so the flux ratio between a star and a planet, ranges from a few million 
to a few billion to one. So stars are vastly brighter than, uh, than planets. So the only way one can actually address this problem is trying to occult the image of the star so we can reveal its faint surroundings. And we've been doing that quite successfully for the past 10, 15 years using uh, large ground-based telescopes like the Keck telescope here in Hawaii, which uh, my group uses a lot, to take pictures of actual exoplanets. In this case, we have a system of four gas giants that are uh, very young. When we say very young in astronomy, we mean a few million years old. So that's very young. So these planets are babies. They just form, they just accreted gas from uh, the initial primordial material surrounding the star. And they are releasing uh, the, what we call the gravitational potential energy. So the energy they've accumulated by accreting the gas they release that energy into heat very slowly over time and they cool off very slowly over time. But still, these planets are around a thousand degree Kelvin. And so, because they are hot, they glow and they glow most um, primarily in the infrared uh, light. So, we use infrared instruments to catch the, uh, the glow of these young planets. And it's exactly what you see in this image. The star is at the center. We've done the best we can to try to remove the light from the star. If you were to look at all the raw data we receive from those telescopes, you, would be, you wouldn't see the planets. We need to use a lot of uh, analysis and uh, it's not a Photoshop, but uh, uh, some clever analysis that we can uh, ap apply to these images to reveal uh, the, the, the four planets. So what is really cool about this movie is that those are actual pictures of exoplanets. And this is a movie of pictures taken a few months apart over the course of a few years. And you see the motion, the orbital motion of these planets orbiting the central star here. Now, you've heard, uh, I suppose, about the James Webb Space Telescope, which just a few weeks ago took its first picture of a planet. Uh, that planet is HIP 65426b, not very, you know, imaginative when we come up with names, uh, there's, but there's a, a code. Uh, so the, this is the name of the star and the letter indicates, uh, you know, that this, this is the second object. The star will be A and the first planet would be named the name of the star with the small letter B, and then we go to C, D, et cetera. And those are four images that were taken by the James Webb Space Telescope of this planet at, at four different filters or colors in the infrared. And this is very useful information because as we measure the light or the flux coming from the planet at different wavelengths, at different colors, we can learn a lot about uh, the temperature of the planet, about its mass, about the gravity at the surface. Um, and then this technique is now going to be applied to many more planets. And hopefully the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to um, take pictures of many more of those young gas giant planets that are still emitting light in the infrared from uh, the energy accumulated during their formation. Unfortunately, the James Webb Space Telescope won't be able to take pictures of planets smaller uh, than gas giants. For that, we need to go to the next level, which I will describe, because our ultimate goal in the field is to take a picture of an Earth-like planet. So now, this is a picture of Earth taken by the Voyager 1 probe that uh, was sent um, a long time ago. This picture was taken in 1990. They turned Voyager uh, in the other direction, uh, pointing at the Earth and took this picture. So this faint blue dot here is the Earth. It's us, all of us here. It's contained in this tiny dot here. So this picture was taken when Voyager was about 6 billion miles away from the sun. And the sun is way off to the side here. You see these streaks of light. It's actually light scattered by the camera uh, of the sun's light that is way off to the side. So now 4 billion miles is a, is a long way away. But the nearest star to us is about uh, a, 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 a thousand times further away than this distance. Right? So that gives you a perspective on the distances. So imagine taking a picture of a pale blue dot 
around the nearest stars is equivalent to trying to take a picture of a firefly swirling around the lighthouse when the lighthouse is on. But the cameraman, a woman, is a thousand miles away from the lighthouse. So this is the challenge here. So this is nearly impossible, but we have a technique to try to address this problem. And this technique is called chronography. So now we'll show a movie that describes what the instrument we use um, is doing to try to extinguish the light from the central star to reveal faint planets around it. This instrument is called a coronagraph. Coronagraph means an instrument to image the corona. So what does it have to do with an exoplanet? Well, it was invented 100 years ago to take pictures of the solar corona outside of natural eclipses. So now let's imagine a system. So this is all CGI, okay, computer-generated uh, graphics. So we have a giant planet. We have an Earth-like planet orbiting the star at the center. So now from the Earth, everything appears to be blended and the planets are not visible, right? So this is just like any other star uh, in the night sky. We don't know before observing it with a chronograph whether or not this system is an Earth-like planet or a gas giant. Now we're going to use a telescope. The larger, the better, because we want a powerful telescope that can collect a lot of light that has a very... Uh, a uh, high angular resolution that can resolve fine details. And now the light from the system, so from the star primarily, propagates inside our instrument, hits a mirror, and then the lens. Now you see an image of the star on our detector, on our camera. So the camera here at the back end is very similar to your iPhone or whatever phone you use. Um, and what you can see here is that the image of a star doesn't look really like a star at all. What we should see, because the star is so far away, is just a point in the image. Right? The star is really, really far away. Um, but what we see here is all these rings. And what are those rings? Well, those rings are due to the fact that light is a wave. okay? And waves make ripples. So we see the effect of the wave nature of light in our image. This phenomenon is well known, it's called diffraction, and those rings are called diffraction rings. Now, what we can try to do is place an occulting spot at the focus of the instrument to try to remove the light from the star. Well, that doesn't work quite well, so we have to use another stop in the system called the Leo stop by a reference to the inventor of this technique to remove most of the light from the star in this image. Now, one can wonder. Where is the planet in here? I still don't see any planet. Well, how would the planet react to a system like this? So the planet light comes at a slight angle inside the telescope, right? The planet is next to the star. So the rays of light come at a slight angle from the angles of the star, which is seen on axis here in yellow. The light from the planet misses the center of the occulting spot. You can think of it as a dime at the focus of the telescope where most of the light from the star lands. But the planet light escapes this occulting spot. Now we're going to try to increase the sensitivity of our camera to see if we see our two planets. Well, we still don't see anything. What we see here instead is what we call scattered light from the central star. So as the light waves propagate in the instrument, they pick up a lot of tiny imperfections in the optical system, right? All the optics in the telescope, the mirrors, the lenses, they are not perfect. All these tiny variations can affect how light propagates. And so to, in order to remove this effect, we have to use a mirror here that can change its shape. It's called a deformable mirror that will then cor correct for these tiny imperfections and now reveal our two planets in the image. So this is a very complicated process, as you can imagine. So we have to have these tiny masks at the focus. We have to have these mirrors that can change our shape. But ultimately, what we get is two images, which we can analyze using a technique called spectroscopy to reveal the content of the atmosphere of these exoplanets. So, all right, let me recap this. So we've used a chronograph to remove the light from the star as much as possible. We've used a mirror that can change its shape to correct for tiny imperfections in our mirrors and, and telescope optics. 
And when we do that, we finally get rid of most of the light from the central star. And then we can see the very faint planets that are a few billion times fainter than the star now in our image. So now that we've isolated the signal from these exoplanets, we can try to analyze the light, right? It's not just taking a picture for the sake of taking a picture. We want to try to do more. And so we do that by sending the light from the exoplanet itself through a prism, okay? And a prism will decompose the light from the planet in, into its fundamental colors, and we call that a spectrum. So a spectrum through an instrument called a spectrograph has been one of the most useful tools in astronomy, in all fields of astronomy, because it reveals the fingerprints of elements. Atoms, molecules have a very specific fingerprints into the color spectrum of an object. So we have here unique features that are uh, specific to hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. I'm showing you here um, some of the spectra of various atoms, but molecules also have their own signatures. So when we collect light from an object, be it a galaxy, a star, or a planet, we can actually determine the composition of this object by taking a spectrum like this. Now, if we were to take a spectrum of the planets of the solar system, like all the rocky planets, Venus, Mars, and the Earth, which have roughly the same size, you can see that the spectrum now, as we draw it as a line, has a very uh, prominent common feature, which is co corresponds to the fingerprints of a molecule of carbon dioxide. So all three planets have carbon dioxide in their atmosphere. Now, if you look at the Earth, there are lots of other features in the Earth that are not present on Venus and Mars spectra. You have water, you have ozone, which is a byproduct of oxygen, and there are many more that I'm not showing here. Okay, so keep in mind that a spectrum like this is a very powerful tool. So once we can take an image of an exoplanet, we can take a spectrum and reveal the content of its atmosphere. So now how to find uh, Earth 2.0? So this is a recipe, all right? So first we need to um, target the right star. Not all stars are created equal. The sun is a good example of a quiet, peaceful star that is very friendly to life. The proof, we are here. So unfortunately, 70% of all stars in our galaxy are not as quiet as the sun. A lot of them are small stars that we call M-type stars. And those stars, they appear cool because they are cooler than the sun or smaller. We can think of them as, you know, small, quiet stars, but actually these stars are the worst. They are very active. They emit a lot of X-rays and UV radiation, especially when they are young. And so the worry is that any planet that would be too close to a star like, like that, which is the most abundant type of stars in our galaxy, would get blasted early on by X-rays and UV radiation that would send its atmosphere away, rendering the, the planet completely sterile. All right. So we would prefer to target stars like the sun, but we are very much interested still in these M-type stars because we found a lot of planets around them. But it's likely that those planets are just bare rocks. We don't know the answer to that yet, and we know very soon I'll get to that. So step number two, after we found a quiet star, is to look for planets through some of the other techniques I mentioned, like the radial velocity technique, for instance, is a good example because it would give us a measurement of the planet's mass. So through that, can we infer whether or not the planet is an atmosphere or is it a bare rock? Now, step three, uh, that once we found a planet around a quiet star that has potentially an atmosphere, is to figure out whether or not this planet is in the Goldilocks zone, so-called habitable zone. So that means at the right distance from the star, such that liquid water can exist at the surface of the planet. If the planet is too close to the star, it will be baked and water won't exist at the surface. If it's too far away, water will freeze and we'll have a frozen world. Okay, so that's step three. 
Now, I would like to come back to these M-type stars because you may have heard of this famous system called TRAPPIST-1, which is a system of seven planets that are transiting their host star that was discovered a few years ago. And the host star is an M-type star. So it's a very small star, but it's a small nasty star that is quite active. Uh, and we see indication of this activity. And the planets, the seven planets of TRAPPIST-1 are fully contained within the orbit of Mercury in our solar system. And yet three of them appears to be in the habitable zone. So how can that be? Well, the habitable zone around the star scales as the square root of the luminosity of the star. So scales with the luminosity of the star. So the fainter the star, the closer in the habitable zone is, right? But then if you're very close to the star, even if the star is not very bright, you're subject to this UV and X-ray radiation, which is uh, very detrimental to, to life, okay? So that's the problem with these M-type stars. We know they have planets around them, but those planets are subject to a lot of radiation just because they tend to be closer to the star than the planets in our solar system or around other sun-like stars. Yet this is a fascinating system that has drawn a lot of attention. And because we don't know the answer to this question, can life emerge or can planets be habit habitable around the most abundant type of stars in our galaxy, the James Webb Space Telescope will still spend a lot of hours observing this system and trying to determine once and for whether or not these planets can sustain atmospheres, even if they are orbiting a very active star. All right, step four, is there water? So we know that life on Earth most likely emerged around or in water. So finding water is the next most important step in our quest for finding Earth 2.0. Now we have a, or let's recap. So we have a star like the sun, very quiet. Uh, we found a planet around it we have a good indication there is a planet around it of about the right size. Um, the planet is in the habitable zone, so at the right distance from its star for liquid water to be at the surface, which doesn't tell us that there is liquid water. We have to find water to say that, so that's step four. Now, the next thing we'll be looking for is the first, what we call the prime biosignature, which is oxygen or ozone. So why is this molecule so important for astrobiologists and people like, uh, like me who are looking for Earth 2.0? Well, oxygen on, on Earth, the amount of oxygen in our atmosphere, which is 21% of, or so, has been uh, generated for billions of years by life, by photosynthesis of trees, plants, and plankton in the sea. And this is constantly replenished by life on Earth. So the amount of oxygen in our atmosphere is, is uh, the result of equilibrium between generation by photosynthesis and sinks by respiration and by sinks in the rocks and the ocean. Um, but so the, the, the vast amount of oxygen in our atmosphere is primarily due to life. So if we find oxygen on another planet that is habitable, that has water, the right size, right distance from the star, it would be a very good indication that there could be life on this planet. So it's a nice story, it works well, but in practice, there may be a catch. There are things like false positives. So there can be oxygen for other reason than life. Life is the most likely, but there may be other, uh, other explanations for the presence of oxygen, like phenomenon like photodissociation of water molecules or uh, rocks or gassing or things like that. So in order to guard against false positives, because it would be pretty bad if we were to announce that well, we found life and we figure out that it's just a volcano, that would be pretty bad. So we need to make sure that there is indeed a life on the planet by trying to find other biosignatures, one of them being methane. So Astrobiologists have been thinking very hard about this question. So there are different scenarios that can be uh, imagined to create uh, oxygen and other molecules. Um, and doing all these studies, now it appears that if we find 
oxygen, ozone, water, carbon dioxide, and methane, all at the same time on a planet that is both at the right distance from a star, around the right type of star, that this would probably be the smoking gun for the presence of life. So, nice story. We have nice ideas for instruments, but is it, is it going to happen or when is it going to happen? So, a few years ago, NASA asked the, uh, the community uh, to study two mission concepts. So, NASA mission concepts like the James Webb Space Telescope uh, to actually address this question. And so there were two studies, one led at JPL, which I was a part of, called Habitable Exoplanet Observatory, and another one led by the Goddard Space Flight Center on the East Coast called the Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared Space Telescope. So these are next generation space telescopes, more advanced even than the James Webb Space Telescope. And one of the prime scientific goals of these missions is to try to find these Earth-like planets, take a spectrum, and seek biosignatures. So the National Academies of Science just a few months ago released uh, the a Decada Review, which happens every 10 years, and set the priorities for NASA and the NASA National Science Foundation, and recommended not one of these two, but a hybrid between these two missions maintaining its scientific goals. So now this mission will likely be implemented by NASA over the next two decades. So it's going to take at least 10 to 20 years to actually uh, mature the technologies and build these observatories that will be launched at the end of the 2030s or early 2040s. So we know the answer in a couple of decades, I assume. So in the meantime, I want to say a few words about all these technologies that I mentioned, the coronagraph, the deformed Vermeers, all these things are being studied very actively by a lot of folks at JPL and here on campus in my group. Um, and JPL is currently building a coronagraph instrument, the first of its kind, and it's going to fly on the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope in 2027. Um, so this will be the very first active coronagraph in space with a mirror that can change its shape in real time. Uh, unfortunately, this telescope is not large enough to see Earth-like planet, but it will be taking pictures of not these young, hot Jupiters, but of more evolved Jupiters like our own Jupiter. Maybe some smaller planets like Neptune-like planets. So look for this uh, mission, which is going to launch in just a few years. And it's amazing to think that the, all the technologies I mentioned today are just being built here in Pasadena. So now from the ground, we are also very much interested in participating in this quest. And large telescopes like uh, this telescope, the 30 meter telescope or the Keck telescope in Hawaii uh, will also be part of the game, but they will focus on these M type stars, just like the James Webb Space Telescope. And they will do that through a combination of transits and direct imaging as well. All right, so I'll just finish on this uh, a quote from Carl Sagan, who said, Many years ago, somewhere, something incredible is waiting to be known. All right. Thank you for your attention. Yes? Can you repeat the question? Ah, the moon. That's a great question, actually. I have one of my students, um, a former postdoc, who are actually developing a new technique to detect exomoons. So moons that orbit exoplanets. We call them exomoons. And so there are a few groups, very few now, because it's really starting only now, that are actually looking for these exomoons. And there are two candidates only. So think of. How many planets we've discovered over the past 30 years? Thousands. Now we're just starting with moons. And maybe in 30 years, we'll have found 5,000 moons. And so this is a pretty cool thing to think about because uh, life can also emerge on moons, right? Potentially. So yeah, we are just starting. So it's, we're very excited. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah? Here. 
You mentioned that you use um, dimming uh, to see if the if a, a star has an exoplanet. Does it matter the, the speed of the star? I imagine if it's going slower, it might dim it more than if it's going faster. But that's just yeah, it's a great question. So, so I, I mentioned that the the amplitude of the dimming gives us the the radius of of the planet, but the the width of the dimming or the time of the transit gives us an indication of how far away the planet is from the star. Because planets that are further away from the star move more slowly and it takes a longer time to transit in front of the star. So we have, we have both information actually. Yeah? You see several transits. So you see several blips, blips, blips. That's what they saw for the TRAPPIST-1 system. They saw blip, blip, and they saw seven of them. They repeated over time. How long typically do you have to watch to get all the information you need to be yes. able to have that separation? So that depends on the separation of the planet, but the typical transit event lasts for a few hours. Additional questions? One moment. I always have to get the children first. Um, do most of these exoplanets have the same weather patterns as Earth, like rain and heat waves and stuff? That's an awesome question. Or we don't know. We don't know yet. But we are we're trying to, to find that out. Yes. And weather and seasons is one of the next steps. After we find all the things I described, one thing that we'd be looking for is whether or not there are seasons, but that will take a long time, right? We'll wait for maybe a few years and see if we see changes over time of some of these features that I mentioned. Yeah. Hi, I'm curious about the mirror that you say can change. Mm -hmm. it, how is it tested, like on some, on our own solar system to see if it's... Yeah, so we... we test those mirrors in, in the lab. Actually, I have a few of them in my lab here downstairs. And um, so there are really small mirrors that are just one inch in diameter. And at the back of these mirrors, you have a lot of actuators that push and pull on the surface. So like pinheads that push and pull, and they are driven by very complex electronics. And so we can, the precision at which we can change the shape of the mirror is, uh, I would say, less than one nanometer, which is 100,000 times smaller than the thickness of a hair. <laughs> and we can do that extremely fast too. So we can react uh, you know, with a fraction of a second, a millisecond or so, to change the shape of the mirror extremely precisely. Of that, like the, when you were showing the demonstration, um, I was wondering, could that be an artifact of this mirror moving? Ah, yes. To so, see? yes, great question. So before we start to move these mirrors, uh, we calibrate very precisely how the mirror will change as we apply voltages to these actuators. So there's a lot of calibration work that goes into understanding exactly how these mirrors move. So that we are sure we don't introduce artifact in the image that would be, no, but that has happened. <laughs> so there's a lot of research going into developing these mirrors and commanding them so they take the exact right uh, shape. One last question for now. Just so the online audience can hear. I was just wondering the, uh, the direct imaging that they're doing now of exoplanets. Is that done with an instrument like a coronagraph or is that just software mag magic that's making so, it happen? No, we are using coronagraphs today. Um, but most of these images, the, the one that I showed with the movie was taken from the ground. And so on the ground, we have, we have an issue that space telescopes don't have, which is our Earth atmosphere. And you probably experienced that outside tonight. The Earth, the Earth atmosphere is not transparent. We think it is, but it's actually a lot of water vapor, other gases. And when the light propagates in our own atmosphere, 
it picks up a lot of these aberrations, a lot of these imperfections. And not only is it like corrugated and messy, it also changes over time because our own atmosphere has a lot of turbulence. And so the turbulence is affecting the quality of the images we can make with even the largest, best telescopes on the ground. And then we have to use a technique that I didn't really mention, which is the, the same as, as the space telescope, which is to use these different amber mirrors to not only correct for the imperfections of the telescope itself, but correct for the effect of atmospheric turbulence. But that requires these corrections to go extremely fast because the atmosphere is constantly changing. So we're chasing the changes in the atmospheric turbulence of our own planet to try to correct and make the best possible images. And these speeds are of the order of a thousand times per second. So we change the shape of the mirror a thousand times per second or several times, several thousand times per second to catch up with the effect of the atmospheric turbulence of our own planet. All right, let's, let's thank uh, Professor Mawe for an excellent presentation. Okay, so it is not the end of our night yet. Um, I was just helping set up the telescopes outside and we're about to start a Q and A, a larger Q and A panel in here. So um, we'll be going for the next hour and fifteen minutes or so until nine o'clock. You guys are welcome to stick around in here. We're going to set up this table and have an astrophysicist Q and A consisting of Professor Mawe, myself, and two other members of the department who work on different areas of research. So uh, if you have some burning question about space or science or astronomy that that that's keeping you up at night, you can ask us, and hopefully we'll be able to. Uh, respond in some capacity that's not just, I don't know, or something like that. Um, and uh, additionally, we'll have the, the telescopes are outside. So if you go straight out the door that you came in and turn right, and then turn right again, there are signs along the walkway that will take you to the athletic fields directly behind us here. And there are three telescopes. They're looking right now, they're looking at the moon, they're looking at Saturn, and I think they're looking at the Hercules cluster, this uh, beautiful cluster of about 100,000 stars that are orbiting around each other that looks really cool. Um, but they'll shift what they're looking at over the course of the night. And we'll be doing this. They'll be doing that for the next hour and 15. And we'll be doing this for the next hour and 15. So you're welcome to come back and forth between the things as much as you want to. Uh, and again, a reminder, we do these once a month. Um, the next one is the beginning of December. Uh, a, a postdoc Dr. Irina Butsky will be talking about the atmospheres of galaxies. And we also do astronomy on tap, the next one of which will be in two and a half weeks on November 14th. Um, that'll be at a, at a restaurant bar in Old Town, Pasadena. So, and we'll take more questions from online in just a moment as well. So I encourage you guys to stick around and ask your questions in the YouTube and Facebook chat. And okay, okay, break. We'll come back. We'll be ready to start the Q&A uh, in about five minutes or so. So I think it was too here. much over. No, you're perfect. It was perfect.
Testing. Um, oh, well, hello. Yeah. All right, so we've got our in-person audience and we have our online audience. Thank you guys for sticking around. We will get to some of your questions momentarily. Um, Dimitri just went outside for a moment. We'll get him back in. But uh, I will have the rest of our panelists give a short introduction to, to themselves and what sort of science they work on to kind of um, premise, to, to, to give our audience a, a, a handle for what sort of expertise we have and what sort of stuff we work on. So um, I'm uh, Cameron Hummels. I, I do research on computational modeling of galaxies and, and the atmospheres around galaxies, trying to better understand how, uh, how galaxies form and evolve over very long timescales because they take hundreds of millions of years to billions of years to really change and evolve. And uh, we can't follow that because we've only really known that galaxies existed for about 100 years. So it's much longer than human or even civilization timescales uh, provide for us to observe. And by modeling these systems in, in computers, we can speed up those times and follow evolution over much longer, larger timescales and see if, if we understand the dominant physical processes responsible for changing galaxies, when we compare them with observations of galaxies we take in the sky. So uh, that's one of the things I work on. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas. I'm a graduate student in physics, but I work here in the astrophysics department. Uh, I'm very, very interested in stars, how they evolve, and in particular, how they interact with each other. Because in astrophysics, stars are this really important thing that everyone has to know about, and they interact with each other a lot. Uh, and I'm also very interested in stellar oscillations uh, and how we can use those to understand what's inside of a star. Because when uh, stars oscillate, that gives you that kind of information in the same way that ringing a bell will tell you if the bell is hollow or not. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm interested in. And Yeah, um, I'm Dee. I'm a grad student here at Caltech in astrophysics. And I also study galaxies, but kind of from the observational side. So I work with a radio telescope that is located at the Owens Valley, which is kind of three hours north of here. Um, and it is essentially working for five full years to take a very blurry picture of a big section of the universe about um, 10 billion years ago. And it's going to use that picture to study how the fuel that makes stars is kind of clumped up at that time. So where that fuel is and how much there is of it is also a big question that we don't know the answer to. And with that, it's going to be able to figure out a lot about how galaxies were made at this time. So it's kind of a special time. This 10 billion years ago is kind of the period of the universe when stars were being formed the fastest. Um, there was the most stars forming. We know that's true. We don't really know what happened to cause that or why that turned off. And so I'm kind of exploring those questions, trying to figure that out, basically, by looking at the material that was there to make those stars in the first place. And Excellent. Okay. And then we also have Professor Dimitri Mawe, who disappeared. Um, do you guys have any questions in, in our audience? Um, I'm going to try and get Dimitri back because there are a number of questions online, but they're primarily exoplanet questions, which seems appropriate for the person who just gave the presentation to answer. So, um, Or if you have additional questions online or in the audience of, of people who aren't Dimitri at the moment, then we can try and address them. Um, but I'll, I'll check back here. I'll check. One second. Yeah, so it's questions about habitable zone, machine learning for planets, kinds of actuators are in the adaptive optics, and how is test delivered so far? See, these are questions that I could answer, but I probably wouldn't do as good of a job answering as Dimitri is doing. Um, what other? Let's see. 
Any questions here? Oh yeah, a question from the here. Let me uh, deliver the microphone. Thank you. All right. So for the stellar oscillations, um, is it possible to use that to sort of get an idea of how far along the stars in its life cycle and like try to predict when it's going to go supernova? Thanks. Uh, that's a pretty good question. Um, so uh, it is true that the uh, astro seismology can actually be used to track the uh, sort of stage of the life uh, of a star. So uh, for me, I'm particularly interested in red giant stars, which are these very evolved stars, which uh, have basically burned all of the hydrogen that are in their cores. And uh, it turns out that you can, uh, these sorts of red giant stars, either they're burning hydrogen in a shell, which is what they do early on. And then at some point they start burning helium. And it turns out that even though the stars look pretty similar on the outside, they actually um, have diff very different stellar oscillations, which can be measured. Uh, I'm not so sure if you can sort of use it to, uh, you know, immediately uh, you sort of like put a quantitative estimate on when exactly it will go supernova. Uh, and for the kinds of stars that uh, I know about, uh, those stars would tend to actually not go supernova. They would be low enough mass that they would become white dwarfs instead. Um, but there is a lot of work on stellar oscillations and uh, the kinds of outbursts that they can uh, launch prior to a supernova that might give us a warning that they will happen. So that's been interesting work as well. Excellent. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you for the question from our audience. Um, there are a handful of questions on YouTube, uh, primarily dealing with exoplanets for our, our speaker, uh, our presenter, Professor Mawe. So one is from Zapfan. Zapfan asks, how has TESS delivered so far? Are there any other missions coming up that will increase the number of exoplanets massively in the same way that Kepler or TESS have done? And maybe it's worth kind of giving an explanation or did you talk about TESS explicitly in your presentation? No, I didn't talk about TESS. Um, well, TESS is a, is a great mission. It, it's uh, very different from Kepler in the, in the sense that it's doing a, a North Sky survey. So it's scanning the sky every, I don't know exactly every, the frequency of the scanning of TESS. And so TESS's objective is to look for uh, the nearest exoplanet. So it's found a lot of candidates. I think the harvest from TESS has been quite fantastic. Uh, the reason why TESS is very interesting is that because the planets it's, it's finding are really close by, they can then be followed up with other telescopes uh, to try to measure other properties like the mass of these planets, if we can use the radial velocity technique. Um, now, the, the other big mission that will do transits as well is called PLATO and it's led by the European Space Agency, and it will launch at the end of, the, of this decade, I believe. And I think that one will also um, bring up its share of, of discoveries, potentially thousands of discoveries. So the telescope I mentioned, the Roman uh, Space Telescope, uh, will have a wide field camera that will have a campaign that will look for uh, exoplanets using a totally different technique called microlensing. So microlensing is an effect due to the distortion of uh, the fabric of space-time uh, by uh, stars and, and planets orbiting them. So uh, the Roman Space Telescope will look uh, towards the, the galactic center where the density of stars is, is just enormous. And the chance of having a microlens event is, is very high as well. So the expected yield for the Roman Space Telescope using this microlensing technique will be in the thousands of uh, planets as well, down to Earth-sized planets. Um, the problem with this mission, it's going to be great. It's going to discover a lot of exoplanets, so we'll be able to do a lot of statistics about the occurrence of small planets. But the problem is that those planets will be extremely far away and there will be no opportunity for follow-ups because this is a one-time event and there is no way to follow up these, uh, these objects with other more traditional methods. I just have 
I just have a follow-up question kind of discussion on that. And that is, so right now we've discovered what, like over 5,000 exoplanets. Right. But if you look at the time scale over which, well, the first one was in the early 90s, right? Yeah. And then it was like a few, and then it was like a big growth with Kepler and Perfect. Tess. And so what do you expect in the next 10 years or 20 years? Do you expect us to be at 50,000? 100,000 discovered objects, or are there other limitations that are like if we kind of filled out the phase space of the region that's easily visible from, from Earth? Or, yeah, at some point, I think we'll, uh, we'll have exhausted our sensitivity once we've discovered all the planets in the solar neighborhood or towards the galactic center. I think that all these techniques will quickly run out of steam and we'll have to wait for the next generation of super giant telescopes to go further in space in our galaxy. So there's still a lot of work to do, but um, I'm, you know, in 10, 20 years, I think we'll, um, we'll probably know of, you know, 100,000 exoplanets. Or really? So. Wow. Okay. But yeah. I think with all these missions that are planned, it's going to be maybe close to 100,000. I see. And I, I was helping set up the telescope, so I missed much of what you talked about, but did you talk about the astrometric uh, wobble as well? Like, will Gaia, like Gaia being a, a mission that's looking at lots and lots of stars across the sky, and it can tell when those stars are wobbling a little bit, when, when it's been staring at them for a very, very, very long time. And that's a similar way to be able to pick up these sorts of things. Like, is there the hope that all of a sudden we're going to get this huge dump of astrometrically detected exoplanets in 10 years or so I didn't years. talk about the technique. So there, I talked about three techniques and okay. we just talked about two that I did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. It's sorry. It's fine. It's fine. Sorry. So Gaia no, is, is a great uh, mission as well. So now it's looking at, at the motion of stars, not along the line of sight, like the radio velocity technique that I mentioned, but on the sky. So we look at the, the, the trajectory of stars on the sky not along the yeah. line of so sight, like wobble so sideways left and side like left so we right. can look at the motion of stars you know in the radi radial direction towards the star but we can also look at the motion of stars sideways and that's what gaia does so it's in effect due to the same uh, gravitational influence of the planet on the star's motion but now sideways the expected yield of Gaia is also in the tens of thousands of, of new planets. Really? And okay. Yes. So it's going to has, be... Has Gaia detected any from the, this technique thus far? They started to release a lot of candidates. Uh -huh. So the first ones we know of are giant planets because they are easier to detect or more massive. So the sideway motion of the star is much larger for giant planets. Cool. But as more data gets released, we now more know more of you know smaller planets. Cool. You guys want to jump in here? Conversation? No. Okay. Uh, we've got some more questions online, but we have a couple questions in the audience, and we'll come back to those in just a second. Okay. Um, so, space newbie, um, we have a lot of things that we're looking at exoplanets. How do you know if it, things aren't going to be like double counted? Since everything is so far away, how do we know that the actual number of exoplanets that we found are actual planets? Because they, they all have different, slightly different properties. And so we can disentangle the signal of several exoplanets within a single system because they will all orbit at different distances. So the signature on the star for the radio velocity technique, the astrometric technique, where they will all be slightly different so that we can disentangle the effect of several objects on the same star. And for direct imaging, they will be uh, sufficiently separated in the image that we won't be confusing them. Maybe one day we'll find two that are very close to each other, they overlap and we, we won't know. But if we wait long enough, they will, the signal will separate and we'll be able to tell. Yeah. Uh, they just released the um, creation, the pillar creation photos. Um, what can, has anyone studied it and see the what we learned? What's different from this new one versus what the, what the hell was it, photo was? So just making sure everybody's familiar with what he was referencing, the Pillars of Creation is this kind of famous image that the Hubble Space Telescope took many years ago. It's a it's a star forming region, isn't it? It's a like a 
So, so it's a nebula of gas in a region that's actively forming stars. And so it, I'm going to do a horrible job if I illustrate it. I encourage you to look it up on your computers or your phones or whatnot. Um, and so this Pillars of Creation shows these three kind of like filaments that are being ablated by really energetic stars and, and light that's around it. And it's, it's kind of uh, pressure confining those pillars of gas, but it's glowing and it's beautiful. Um, and then the James Webb Space Telescope just took an image of that, of that same field and it looks recognizable, but it's very different in terms of the light that you can see because of course the James Webb Space Telescope is observing that in the, in the infrared part of the spectrum. So longer wavelengths of light, which reveal different sorts of structures. For the most part, infrared can see through, um, well, the near infrared can see through a lot of dust in the same way, in, in a way that visible light might be obscured. It might get um, either reddened uh, in the same way that if you are in the middle of the desert and a dust storm kicks up and you look towards the sun, it tends to be much redder because the dust is absorbing preferentially the blue light but it also can block out that light. And whereas in the infrared, you can more effectively see through that. And you can see this, that certain th features that are in the, the Hubble Space Telescope image are kind of gone and you can kind of see through the, the stuff that was, that was emitting that light or scattering that light. Um, but in terms of the science that will necessarily be done with that, uh, certainly there will be science that's done with it. <laughs> Um, but I think that being in the, uh, in, in being released in such a public way was much more of an aesthetic beauty sort of thing and showcasing the differences from that you can see between the two. Um, it'll certainly reveal some information about, like I said, the dust content in that, that, that star forming region and, and and put constraints on the various different species that are that are present in that kind of environment. But um, so it may also be that because infrared light can pierce through the veil of dust and gas much more effectively than visible light, that we will now detect objects that were just hidden from sight, uh, like young forming stars, for instance, for instance, that are still surrounded by a cocoon of matter of gas and dust. Um, and so studying those young stars may be interesting in trying to understand, you know, how they form and how they uh, maybe uh, have planets around them that are also being formed and things like that. And that's not possible in the visible because again, those are hidden within their cocoon. Now we can see through the cocoon. So I'm just checking out the questions that people have asked online here. Um, there is a question. Can A, B, or even O-type stars ever have planets in the habitable zone? And for that, I think we probably need to introduce the idea of A, B, and O-type stars before we get to that. But Nicholas? So I guess we can do a little bit of introduction to stars. Yeah. So most stars are on what's called the main sequence that is basically like stars that are hydrogen burning they're just sort of stars like our sun although they can be of all different masses and we usually categorize such stars uh using this weird system of letters so from bluest so blue means hot from hottest to coldest which is red we have obafgkm for some reason, uh, this is what was settled upon historically. And so OBA means like the three classifications of stars, which are the hottest. So the question was basically uh, around such stars is a habitable zone possible? And uh, I can say some words about that. But I mean, the answer is the way that habitable zones are usually defined is just like the like distance away that a planet would have to be to uh to be like sort of for us to estimate it to be hot enough to have liquid water on it and so uh yes it's true that for those stars uh, there is like such a region uh it would obviously be farther out because these stars are hotter so you can go farther out uh, you have to go farther out before uh, the planet will be cold and uh, cool enough to have liquid water on it um, but these are always estimates because like the real temperature 
on the planet will depend on things like the atmosphere. Uh, and there are probably other factors that affect whether or not life can exist besides just the existence of liquid water. Great answer. Uh, if I may add, um, we can always define the habitable zone any, around any object, um, hot object. The, the problem with these stars is, are, is that they are typically short-lived and uh, they may not live long enough for life to, to emerge because it took roughly, I don't want to say anything stupid, but a billion, billion years for life to emerge on Earth. Um, and so a lot of these stars actually will be go long gone uh, before that. Uh, they will either explode or have very strong wind and eject their gas away. And so not, not very friendly environments for life to, to emerge. So relatedly, there's a question, uh, if, if planets or if stars like Betelgeuse, um, since it's Halloween, right? Uh, if stars like Betelgeuse, which is this red supergiant, can that type of star, which is not a main sequence star, like what was being described by Nicholas, but can, can these red supergiants also host, have we detected exoplanets around like supergiant stars before? I honestly don't know. I don't think so. Okay. Um, Cause it seems like those, although people at least have, in the solar system, right? Yeah. The sun will eventually become a supergiant right. in a few billion years. And when it does so, it'll swell from its existing size and the surface will actually absorb all the way out to Earth's orbit or the Mar Mars orbit. Right. And in that case, I imagine it will wreak a lot of havoc on the, I mean, outer planets, it won't be yeah. good for the inner planets and the outer planets will start moving around in their orbits right, right. as well. Yeah, the, and I don't know if they'll be ejected or absorbed or. The real question is, can these outer planets survive, survive. reorganize in some fashion? So you have stumbled upon a topic that I actually work on. Oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, so I don't work on red supergiants, but I do work on red giant stellar evolution uh, a lot of the time. And actually, uh, something that we've recently been trying to explain is that uh, basically we've detected, or uh, we have some collaborators who have detected this sort of close, hot Jupiter-like planet. Uh, not hot. It's not really that hot, I guess. But it's like, um, it's a Jupiter mass-ish planet. And it's around uh, what's called a clump star or uh, a star that burns helium in its core. And in order to do this, the star has to basically sort of exhaust all the hydrogen that it wants to burn. So it sort of grows very big. And so when our sun does this, it's going to basically engulf Mercury, Venus, and maybe even the Earth. And somehow this, so like for our sun, it's going to do this and our, uh, it's almost going to reach out to our orbit, which is at like 365 days. And this uh, planet's actually at 90 days. And so somehow it exists, even though it's not supposed to. Hmm. And so there's some ideas that we've been proposing about um, the idea that maybe some kind of stellar merger causes the helium to ignite early. But these are the sorts of questions that are really interesting because you, you, know, you, you sort of do expect that uh, you know, events like uh, a star turning into a red giant will wreak tons of havoc on a solar system. But then you will, uh, you know, make these discoveries that sort of push the frontier of what can be possible when uh, weird things happen with stars. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay, great. Had some new people come in. Do you have any, I'll go back to, we've got plenty of questions online. Thank you, online audience, YouTube and Facebook. Um, but are there any questions from our live audience? Yeah. Um, for the, in one of the slides, the, um, you showed how to detect planet was like the the star and the planet was orbiting something else in the middle. Like, what is it? Um, uh, what is it that caused the star to not be in the center of the of, of the gravity gravity pole? Like, what's in the center that causes the star not to be in the center? Yeah. So the thing about gravity is, um, have you ever heard the like equal and opposite attraction thing for electromagnetism for electricity? So gravity does the same thing. So while the star is way, way bigger than the planet, and it's mostly going to be unmoved by the planet. 
the same force of gravity that's pulling the planet towards the star is also pulling the star towards the planet. You can't disentangle that ever. And so even though it's a way, way smaller force, on the star compared to the mass of the star, it's still there and it's still going to move the star around. And so what they are both orbiting around is not anything real, but it's a theoretical thing called their center of mass. And so it's like when you average out the system, it's all balanced around this one point that you can point to when you're doing the math. And so they're both going to orbit around that basically. And that's Weird to think about that a little planet could wobble something that big, but absolutely the Earth wobbles the sun um, in that same way. It's just so small that it's really, really hard to see. Excellent. There is a question from our YouTube audience asking, can super Earths have liquid water or oceans on their surface? Yeah, absolutely. But uh, we haven't found any evidence for that yet but there's no reason why not okay and in terms of because i always get hazy on this and you may have covered this in your in your presentation what's the rough mass that we consider something to be a super earth like earth mass times a few yeah it's it's 50 percent larger than okay. the earth okay typically. and then above that then it becomes a a a baby neptune or something like this yeah mini neptune yeah mini neptune. so the limit between super earth and mini mini neptune in terms of mass is very fuzzy ah. uh and what will be the the answer is whether we can actually detect an atmosphere and determine its properties okay okay so are are any of the kind of planet mass ranges not allowed to have liquid water on their surface i guess it's just their position in the in the near proximity to the star that for the most part determines if liquid well, water they also have to have a rocky surface rocky right? surface right yeah. you can't have a jupiter that's primarily a gaseous no. object having liquid water on the surface right. it would just foof, fall in exactly. through the clouds yeah okay so now what would be interesting is to have you know, a gas giant in the habitable zone that may be surrounded by moons that would then be rocky and have potentially water at their surface. Kind of like we have with Jupiter and we have, you know, Io in Europa right. and yeah. Ganymede and Callisto. Right. And three of those have what we think to be icy surfaces right. with some sort of liquid interior. Now you can bring Jupiter a little bit closer into the sun and the moons would become liquid maybe habitable maybe yeah just in case you're thinking that would be extremely expensive and difficult to do to bring jupiter closer to the sun so elon if you're if you're listening don't try and don't try and do that don't try and do that um are there other questions here yeah thank you sir this is a less technical question, more of just kind of curious. Um, you mentioned you studied exoplanets for decades. And uh, just what got you interested in them besides answering the age old question of are we alone? Good question. Um, okay. Um, so I, I have a background in engineering and uh and physics and originally i didn't really care or i mean uh, about exoplanets <laughs> but i was given a, a technical problem to solve very early on when i was a student that was to actually make a better chronograph and i found that specific technical problem very motivating and that got me into the field from the technology angle. And uh, then after that, I started to get interested into the science and what this technology could actually do. But, you know, the, the path is not as straightforward. Oh, I want to find more exoplanets. No, I was actually more interested in solving a technical problem, a challenge, if you want. And then after that, I really got interested into what this could actually help doing and help solve in terms of 
scientific questions. Um, I wonder if, um, have you heard of Planet Nine? And can you explain what it is? <laughs> and have it been found yet? <laughs> oh, so. Sure. Planet Nine. So as we know, there are eight planets. Eight because Pluto is not usually classified as a planet anymore. And the reason for that is that there are a lot of objects that we have discovered that are very similar in sort of size and location to Pluto, like objects like, like uh, Eris or uh, Makemiki and others. Uh, but the interesting thing about them is if you sort of do a survey of the ones that we found, you sort of find that they have like sort of similar orbits, like they sort of, they're all sort of like elliptical orbits that sort of point in a similar direction. And so one question might be, how did all of those planets look like that? Is it because, you know, we have a selection effect? Well, maybe. But if this is, you know, really what's happening is that uh, many of these uh, objects all have the same orbits, uh, we, you know, we might want to question, like, why did they form that way? But maybe the more relevant question is, why are these the only ones that survived? And uh, so the idea of Planet Nine is somehow uh, this idea that in order to explain why the like any other orbits and uh, sort of dwarf planets with any other orbits were kicked out, uh, that the, the most logical explanation might be that there's just this very big planet that just sort of, sort of interacts with them and kicks them out unless their orbit looks a very specific way. Um, so that's the basic idea. I mean, we've never found the planet, so it's still a hypothesis, uh, but it's it's a cute idea. It's actually, um, I, I believe it was proposed by Konstantin Batygin here, a uh, professor across the street, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're interested, um, there are both Konstantin and Mike Brown, who's a professor in the Planetary Science Department, have given public talks here. Um, Constantine actually didn't talk about Planet Nine, but Mike did. And if you look back on YouTube, we have a recording of all of our previous talks. And if you just search through the Caltech Astro YouTube channel, you'll find the one by Mike Brown, where he talks about the search for Planet Nine and gives a little bit more detail. So it's really good. It has like 50,000 views. So, uh, but um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Another question? Oh. Hello. Oh, here. Say it again. Why are planets not round and not? Uh, why are planets round and not flat? Okay. Why are planets round and not flat? You want me to do Who it? wants to talk about? That's a very good question. Symmetry? So that yeah, that's a very good question. It's kind of weird that when we're on earth, we look at stuff and everything is a bunch of different shapes. But then when we look at big things, they just all look like spheres. Uh, and the basic reason for that is that when you're looking at really big stuff, the gravity, like the force of gravity is really, really important. And it turns out, so gravity is this force that like, when you have two masses, it sort of attracts them together. And if, you know, there is some configuration of masses that can like rearrange itself for things to get closer together to each other, then gravity will want that to happen. And it turns out that a sphere is basically the way to get stuff as close together as possible. So that's really what gravity wants to do to things. So when you have a lot of mass, like a, like an Earth's worth of, ma worth of mass or like a Jupiter's or a star's worth of mass, it will like always try and make itself into a like a sphere because that's the way for like because gravity wants to pull things together that's the way for you to put masses as close together as possible Most compact sort of thing so if we were to take this table nice flat table right and we blow it up to be a million times the size that it is right now gravity which as nicholas said is this really attractive force it 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 takes any two objects dimitri has mass this has mass they're pulled towards each other it's very slight, but on very, very large scales, it becomes measurable. And they pull, to, we, we, ah, we're pulled together into this compact little mass. And the same would go with this table. If it were a million times the size, it would pull itself into this compact sphere, this ball of stuff. 
And so all the planets that we see when we look up in the sky, they're all these spherical structures instead of being flat because the gravity pulls them into that. Sorry to just repeat what you said. Yeah, no, it's it's no problem at all. Uh, just to make that very clear, like if you were a planet, what would happen would be your arms, like they're far away from each other. <sighs> they will like attract each other and they'll like attract your chest and your head will come down and attract your chest. And then eventually you'll curl up into a ball because all of the parts of your body want to get close to each other. And that will keep happening until you become a sphere. Until you turn into a big beach ball. Um, so, uh, talking about gravity, which is like literally super interesting, but what came first, like the gravity or the planet? Cause like, I would assume something have to move to begin with, to create like, right. Like gravity is created by something. Like what was the first thing that existed? Basically. I know like nobody have the answer, but I'm curious what you guys think. Yeah, that's a that's a very hard question, but I think the answer is gravity came first. So gravity, we think, is kind of like a we don't really know why it's there, but we know it's kind of a fundamental fact of the universe that gravity exists and it makes heavy things pull together and attract each other. So basically what we think happened is that, you know, the universe was formed, stuff was formed and gravity was already there and it was starting to pull that stuff together and clump it up until it made stars and those stars made galaxies and then like evolved and all that like just gas that was just floating around at the beginning gets pulled towards these stars that were made and makes planets of the, its own so I don't think there is anything that doesn't move. I don't know. Because the issue is everything is relative. In order to say that something's not moving, you need to be able to point it somewhere and be like, that's still. And everything else is already moving. So there's no way for you to do that. So you can stop moving with reference to something else. Like we're sitting, we're not moving with regard to each other right now. Um, but that's really, I think, the strictest statement you can make about it. Did you? I guess like one thing to clear up is like, so I think probably throughout this talk, we've been talking about gravity in the context of like uh, being the reason why things go in like sort of go in circular orbits around stars or something like this. Uh, and it's kind of maybe it's a little confusing to sort of square that with the other thing that we're usually told about gravity, which is that it is like sort of an attractive force between two objects. Like you think like, oh, well, if it's an attractive force between two objects, you know, why doesn't like, for example, a plan just get attracted to the star and like fall in or something. Seems like these are like not the same thing. But if you sort of ever done the experiment where you sort of uh, take a bucket like by a rope and sort of do like do this, you realize that um, even though like the, the act of keeping the bucket going in a circle requires you to pull on the, the rope. And that's sort of the role that gravity's playing. Gravity is like in that particular case. Um, you know, the reason why the the bucket doesn't just fly off in a direction in a straight line. But gravity doesn't only do that. Uh, not everything in the universe orbits in a circular way around something, but everything in the universe is experiencing gravity. And for things that are sort of on small scales, small being smaller than galaxies or smaller than a few galaxies, it basically just behaves like attraction. And so things like orbits happen, although they don't have to be circular and they don't have to be orbits. Uh, but interestingly, on very large scales, gravity actually is known to behave differently. It's sort of, it's sort of repulsive. It makes the uh, universe sort of expand uh, and accelerate. Uh, but that's sort of a totally different story that is on very, very large scales for unknown reasons. One second. There's a there's a really interesting question from the YouTube, the online audience, and then we'll get to your question in a second. Um, so there are a couple of questions on here about the black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy that you may have followed. Um, it's called Sagittarius A star, which is just a fancy term because it sits in the constellation of Sagittarius. Um, and the questions are 
was the mass accretion rate of Sagittarius A star faster when our galaxy was just formed? And why is Sagittarius A star's accretion rate so slow now? Can that slow rate indicate that our the density of the stuff around Sagittarius A star is very low? So this is pretty exciting. So let's just put this in context. When people are talking about mass accretion rates and things like that, they're talking about how quickly this black hole is is absorbing stuff, is it is eating stuff. It's a fancy term, accrete, but it's just like absorbing this stuff. And because we see supermassive black holes that aren't in our galaxy, that are around, that are in the centers of other galaxies, and they're really, really bright. It's not that light is coming from the black hole. That's impossible, right? That's what makes it a black hole. Light can't escape. It's coming from the region around the black hole. When stuff falls in, it gets really, really, really hot. And when stuff gets really, really hot, like, like think of the element in your oven or the element on your stove. When it gets hot, it starts to glow red. Then maybe it glows. If you turn it way up higher than my oven goes, it'll turn white or blue. This stuff that's near that black hole gets really, really hot and it starts to glow and it's very bright. But if we look at the black hole, this so-called Sagittarius A star in the center of our galaxy, it doesn't glow for the most part at least not at wavelengths of light that our eyes are, are sensitive to. Um, and so the question is, does that mean that because it's not glowing and that there's not a lot of stuff that's falling into it, that the density of stuff around that, that black hole is pretty low? And I think that's exactly what it means. It means the stuff around that is pretty low. Um, and the other part of that question was, was it higher and was it brighter earlier on in the formation of our galaxy? And of course, we can't know that very well because we weren't around for it. But I think the answer is probably yes. Don't you guys think so? I think it's probably yes. When you're forming galaxies, it's kind of a messy business. And there's a lot of stuff going all over the place. And so there's probably a lot of stuff that's lost its angular momentum and fallen into the center. And that stuff is falling onto the galaxy and so it's or onto the black hole. And so it's starting to glow and get hot right before it falls in. So we don't know, but I would say probably as someone who researches partially on this topic, but not entirely on this topic. Yeah, I think I would also agree with that. I would say just to kind of put this in context of what we were talking about earlier about orbits and stuff, and we're just introduced black holes and all of a sudden gas is glowing. So this is the exact same phenomenon we were talking about earlier, where you've got a planet that's spinning around a star and it's gravity that's holding it in, except suddenly it's going to be a black hole, which is basically just a bigger clump of matter that has really strong gravity that's acting on the stuff around it. And instead of a planet, it's the whole star that's orbiting around or just like gas. And when we talk about things accreting or falling onto the black hole, that just means that this orbit that we're talking about, like when you're spinning the bucket, the bucket needs to move fast enough to like pull on the rope to keep the water inside of it. And if the bucket ever slows down, um, the water falls out or the bucket falls down and you get wet. Uh, and so that's what's going on when stuff is falling on. The angular momentum Cameron was talking about is that bucket, that star spinning around the black hole is slowing down. And that means that suddenly it can't stay where it is around the black hole and it's falling onto the black hole and that's making the black hole bigger. Um, and that's really important for the whole galaxy because um, there's lots of things that are weird happening with gravity around the black hole. And so things falling onto the black hole kind of affect the surroundings of the black hole. And so there's larger implications there. Excellent explanation. Thank you, Dee. Okay. And uh, you were very patient. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask, uh, we mentioned the gravity before. So I was curious, is our Earth like moving close to the sun? right now or is our heat because of that i don't know i'm just wondering thank you so is the orbit of the earth does that does it move close to the sun and is that responsible for the how why the earth is getting warmer and such 
whoa, we can, we can, we can do a whole diagram here. Although our pens aren't dark enough on this. Um, do one of you guys want to take this? I don't want to yap the whole time. I mean, I will, but I don't have to. Yeah. yeah? I, I missed okay. the question a little bit. So. Um, does the, do the, does the trajectory of the earth come close to the sun and is that partially responsible because we were talking about gravity and orbits earlier and is that somewhat responsible for for the heating of the earth or does it change the heating of the earth over the course of the year or things like this so, you can definitely draw a diagram yeah so um the earth yeah do you want do you want to the uh, try and find a dark pen there's so many pens here and half of them work um and we'll try and see if the YouTube audience can even make out these things. I don't know if they can. So for the most part, the, the earth is, it's, it's roughly in a circular orbit around the sun. And so it doesn't change the distance to the sun very much. It's not like, um, so if this is the sun and I am the earth, it's not, it's not doing this, like where it gets really, really close. And then it gets really, really far in an eccentric orbit. For the most part, it's as Nicholas has drawn, it's for the most part, it's in a circle and it doesn't get that much closer. I think the distance, the eccentricity allows a 10% change, roughly five or 10% change. Is that, it's a few percent Very change small. between when it's at its closest and when it's at its far, far, farthest away. For the most part, it's always roughly at the same distance away from the sun. So the changes that we have in the heating on the earth Certainly the sun is responsible for most of the heat and the energy that we get. But um, the, the changes that we have on the earth, like the seasons aren't caused by us getting closer and farther away. They're caused by this tilt that the earth has. Um, so it's instead of it being perfectly, Oh, let's see. How can I align this? Um, instead of it being perfectly, it's, rotating around in the same axis at which it orbits around, it's offset by about 23 degrees. And so at some points of the year, it's the, the, the lower part, the Southern pole region gets more sunlight. And so that would be summer in, that would be uh, like January, December period when it's warmer in the Southern hemisphere and it's colder here because we're getting less light. And then later in its orbit, it gets to the other side of its orbit where the, the, the North Pole is getting more sunlight, and that's when it's summer here and it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere. So that's like July, August. Yeah. Um, so there's uh, an interesting misconception that people sometimes have, which is that, yes, it is true that the Earth sort of slightly moves closer and away from the sun, uh, but it actually turns out, uh, I mean, that is not the reason why we have seasons on Earth. And one way to see why that would be the case is that in Australia, they actually have seasons at the opposite time. So when we have winter, they actually have summer. Uh, and so clearly we're not like on opposite sides of the sun uh, when you go to Australia or something. But um, And it turns out to be the case actually that winter here aligns, I, I believe it aligns with us being closer, it, it turns out. So I don't know if I drew that correctly. Um, and it's also very interesting as a side note that, uh, having seasons is not like a given for a planet. And so it sort of requires that your the sort of spin axis of your planet, not really move around. And it turns out that it's, I think people typically believe this is because we have a moon and the moon sort of like acts as this big lever arm that prevents that, uh, tilt from changing very much. And it turns out other planets that don't have massive, uh, moons like for example mars actually they just sort of change their spin axis very often their seasons are not they're very very chaotic yeah so there are a lot of things that go into it is there any work that's being done on detecting white holes and if so what's it and why would it be interesting White well, holes. it'd certainly be interesting. White holes. So I think just to make sure everybody uh, is on the same page. So everyone, I think, is familiar with the idea of a black hole. It's this um, almost mythical object, really. But it's a very dense object in space that becomes so dense that the escape velocity, uh, that is to say the speed that you need to achieve to escape the gravitational pull of it, is so high that it exceeds the speed of light. and so 
you know, the, the stereotype is nothing, not even light can escape from one of these objects. And then there's this theoretical construct that people refer to as a white hole. That is, if there is a black hole, um, potentially it's not just going down into this small region of space time and being enclosed that perhaps it's punching through space time entirely and causing a wormhole that everything goes in and eventually gets spat out somewhere else in space right so if i i fall into this black hole sorry you're not the black hole d i fall into this black hole and this diagram and i i get ripped up but then i get spat out somewhere else in space from this white hole um we don't have as far as I can tell, we don't have any evidence, any observational evidence that such a thing exists. You'd think that it'd be pretty bright on the sky, right? If it's just throwing out stuff, both light and, and energy and radiation. Um, I don't think there are any formal searches for something like that, but we're, we're definitely doing all sorts of searches for different types of objects and sensitive to different kinds of objects in the sky. And we would probably recognize such a thing that just had a very... I mean, I, I don't know. I guess a white hole would probably have. Oh, goodness. What would a spectrum look like from a white hole? Yeah, this is. Yeah. I smell a talk coming up, a public presentation. We'll have to get somebody. Uh, maybe, Niels, you can give a talk about I mean, I was gonna white make it holes. Up. One of the audience members is. Um, is uh, is a scientist in the field who who or in the department who works on black holes um who's going to be one of our speakers for astronomy on tap in a couple of weeks talking about that but do you have any opinions on white holes should i hand off the microphone to you all right okay here we go uh so einstein's theory of gravity gives you a bunch of fun math to do and then math gives you ideas like you can say oh this this happens black holes exist and gravity is attractive but there's all also other solutions um so like if you're familiar with star trek you have warp drives and and you can actually generate a warp drive solution to einstein's equations you can do all the math and you're like this exists the problem with this is that you actually need matter that doesn't exist in our universe like nothing would work the way it does anymore in terms of all the other forces and so like the white hole concept is sort of in that way. Yeah, you can plug it in and the math works. It's just all the other physics breaks. And so that's that's usually what happens with these kinds of things. Thank you. I think uh, there's so there are a few interesting things to say about it. I think um, one of the Nobel Prizes, which was given, I think, in 2020 was to Roger Penrose, who's sort of very distinguished in many ways. But I think the prize was given because he actually demonstrated mathematically not just that black holes like are allowed in general relativity, but that if you that they're basically gonna form like or like it's very it's not very hard to form them. It's not like you need to like sort of throw mass in a very specific way. It's it's sort of like happen. It's like expected to happen. Um, and white holes, on the other hand, it's like very hard to think of a way to make such a thing or why nature would uh, want to make those things. And as Neil said, those um, kinds of things do appear as like things that can happen in general relativity. And sometimes they occur in sort of very unusual places. And so one example, and he's going to like make angry faces at me probably, uh, but it's okay. He doesn't have the microphone. Uh, is that uh, if you have rotating black holes, for example. So if you have a black hole, it sort of has like an infinitely dense sort of singularity thing at the center. Um, but if it's a rotating black hole, which all black holes are, then it turns out that that becomes sort of a ring, sort of mathematically. It's like now a ring, ringularity, it's called. And it turns out that mathematically you can imagine like going through it. And then I think there's a white hole on the other side of that solution, right? But so the. <laughs> Where does it? So then, mathematically, it's possible, but is it actually possible? Well, who knows? We write equations all the time as physicists that make things that don't exist. So, I, I don't know. All my equations exist. Everything, <laughs> everything's real. Um, there. Were, oh, oh, another question. Okay. There you go. Uh, has anyone been in a black hole? 
Has anyone been in a black hole aside from Matthew McConaughey's character in the famous interstellar movie that came? Oh, spoiler, spoiler. Um, I think it's fair to say the answer is no, no one has, no one has been in a black hole. Um, it would hurt a lot. So, so we talked about gravity. Remember your question about how, uh, if you, made this made made you or this table increase dramatically it's your gravity would compactify you oh compactify you into a a, a ball like a big beach ball um so the gravitational force around a black hole is really really intense and so anything that gets close to it essentially gets stretched out because the gravitational force like if i'm if I'm falling in towards this feet first, towards this table, which is actually a black hole, my feet, because they're closer, feel more of a pull than my head does. And so I get stretched out like a medieval torture device. And there's actually the, the term that gets used is spaghettification because you get turned into like spaghetti noodles. You get stretched out. Um, and so, yeah, it would be painful. And you probably wouldn't survive. And, but fortunately, there are no black holes in the immediate vicinity around the Earth or the solar system. Although this does raise a question that was brought up online, and that is wasn't there a theory, you know, a hypothesis at one point uh, that Planet Nine, which we were describing before, this this uh, predicted object in the outer solar system is actually a miniature black hole. I and that is a hypothesis. I don't think it's a necessarily a well-founded hypothesis, but it's a possibility. No. Yeah. Uh, there is, there is this paper actually that these people wrote where they like one of the pictures in the paper was like, a black circle and they're like this is the actual size that this black hole would have to oh be. that it was like six inches across yeah, yeah. or something yeah so that's right because if you were to make the earth if you were take to take the entire earth and you wanted to compress it down to where it formed into a black hole you take the entire earth you have to compress it down to be about half an inch in diameter everything in the earth you me this table the rocks the mountains compress it down so it's about this big across then that's what it takes to compress it to, to get to the densities necessary for that to actually become a black hole. So it's a tiny little black hole, tiny little guy. So one more thing I want to say just about black holes and uh, falling into them is that if they're actually really big, uh, you can fall through them uh, without... Oh. Uh, <laughs> fall through? Sorry, fall, fall in through the, the event horizon oh. or so, like without feeling much. Uh, and... and, and but just wait a little bit and then it becomes bad. Yeah. But as, as a student, uh, you, you might not like to do homework, but if, uh, you know, you become a college student studying astrophysics, an actual homework assignment that I once got was estimate how big a black hole needs to be before falling in, into it isn't painful. <laughs> and the solutions required um, estimating like sort of the... Uh, <laughs> like sort of the the force needed to pull apart a person by pretending that they're a giant carrot. This is actual like like material that you do when you're an astrophysics student. So <laughs> homework is sometimes fun. Uh, sometimes. Uh, there was another question online about exoplanet searches. There were two kind of related and unrelated questions. One was, can gravitational waves be used to study exoplanets, planets around other stars? And then the other question that's somewhat related is, do, you, do we now use data science techniques like machine learning techniques to sift through the data that are coming in from our telescopes to be able to better identify uh, some of these exoplanet candidates? Yeah, so the to the first question, the answer is I don't think so, because planets are not nearly massive enough to generate gravitational waves that we can detect anytime soon. Uh, for the second question, yes, absolutely. Uh, machine learning is uh, is very much technique we use in pretty much all fields of uh, exoplanet science and all the techniques we use to look for them. Uh, so from sifting through 
photometric data from the test telescope that we talked about earlier today to um, using libraries of thousands or millions of images to try to understand better patterns and systematics. So yes, machine learning is, is more and more used um, every day. Additional questions from the in-person audience? Oh, yeah. Oh, another question. A question from our junior member here. Do, do you have a question? Yeah, I'll get to you in one moment. Yeah. Um, so my question was for um, anyone on the panel or scientists here. I was curious if any of you have made any or submitted any proposals or plan to submit proposals to use the James Webb telescope? And if so, what are you what are you uh, looking to do? Yes. Anybody using James Webb? Yeah. Dimitri? Yeah. Uh, so I was uh, part of the uh, very large team. There were 70, 80 people uh, that were, um, you know, working together to get this image I showed earlier. Now I'm also uh, the co-principal investigator of a program that will look at Alpha Centauri, so the nearest star to Earth, to look for a planet. The second nearest star to Earth. Right. Yeah. After, Sorry. After sun, the sun. sun. The sun is the nearest. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, and we should get that data next summer if everything goes well. So, we may know if there is a planet around Alpha Sen that we can image. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. Do, so, but we do know that there are planets around Alpha Centauri and Proxima Centauri. Proxima, yes. Proxima, yes. I see. But not, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Are you guys involved in any, James, what? So this is not the, the group I'm working with now, but the group I worked with for my undergrad research um, has some James Webb time. And what they're looking at is galaxies that are at the center of very big clusters of many, many galaxies. So galaxies tend to clump up in the universe. And at the center of these big clusters of galaxies, there's going to be one galaxy that's even bigger than all the rest because it's sort of gravity is just feeding this galaxy other galaxies and it's kind of just swallowing them up and getting really, really large. Uh, and that's really interesting because it's a really cool environment for new stars to be made because this galaxy is so big. It's sort of like a, a fun edge case that we can look at and figure out star formation in general. Um, but also because it's at the center of this galaxy cluster, the cluster itself is going to affect how these galaxies evolve. Um, they're called brightest cluster galaxies. And so we are using James Webb, well, they are, um, to image these galaxies um, in the infrared, which is kind of one of James Webb's science cases is all the light that around us is light that our eyes can see, optical light. Um, once you get kind of further out into the universe, the expansion of the universe is gonna stretch that light into the infrared. So it's gonna be slightly lower energy than what our eyes can see. But like we have hundreds of years of science based on what our eyes can see just because it's the easiest to kind of understand. So we figured it out first. And so a lot of the techniques that we use for studying galaxies are based on that light. And so the more distant galaxies to apply those techniques, we need the infrared light. And so that's really the main thing that James Webb is going to do for them is to have these infrared observations to study um, that. And the fact that it's so big means that it's able to see small things like very distant galaxies very well. And so we'll be able to actually resolve these galaxies and kind of see not only the amount of light that's there, which kind of vaguely corresponds to how big they are, but also how that light is distributed, which might tell us some things about how um, that galaxy is like being fed other galaxies by the cluster. So, yeah. Nicholas, are you involved in any James Webb? Yeah, good question. So um, I, I'm not personally at the moment, but I... Uh, SSD, my undergrad group, so my group when I was in college actually also has uh, interest in using James Webb. Uh, and so uh, it's sort of a very uh, different kind of science. What they're doing is they're sort of looking towards the galactic center, looking towards our black hole, Sagittarius A star, 
and also the stars that are around it. And it turns out um, that it, like, I mean, there are a lot of interesting questions. Like there are some star clusters in that region, uh, which are sort of uh, subject to sort of the most intense tidal forces that any star clusters are really subject to. And they have these weird, bizarre stellar populations that have more massive, more big stars than like other stellar populations usually have. Uh, and then there's the business of like what stars there are in the star little tiny star cluster and little tiny like disk of stars like immediately outside of that black hole. Uh, and you know all of these questions are uh, very much aided by James Webb, which is able to take very precise measurements uh, in the infrared where we can see through the dust between us and the galactic center. So I think this was mentioned before. I think Cameron mentioned it. But if you just try to look at the galactic center, you won't see the black hole. You won't see anything. You won't even see the stars really close to the black hole because I think the I think we did this calculation once, and in the optical, uh, you would basically like like one like only one in like a hundred million photons in the visible like spectrum would actually come out of the galactic center and make it to our eyes. Um, so if you look in the infrared, you can actually just all the dust becomes transparent to you because and, of dust. Dust is yeah. obscuring all of it. Yeah, exactly. And it it still like you know gets absorbed a lot, but it's much easier to see through it when you use infrared. Uh, and so yeah, I think it's fair to say that all of us are at some at some level quite interested in what James Webb has to offer. And as you can see, our science is all very different, but that's why these sorts of surveys are like so unifying. I'm not on any James Webb Space Telescope proposals, but my girlfriend observed using James Webb today, and she was looking at data of Io, which is one of the moons around Jupiter. And I haven't talked to her yet about, she was like, I'm looking at James Webb data that was taken today. So it's pretty exciting, but that's not my science, so I don't really know. Uh, but it's, there's a bunch of volcanoes on Io. It's a pretty exciting place. We have time for one last question on, I think, I think it's from you. What is your question? Um, how is a black hole made? How is a black hole made? <laughs> oh, oh, this could be a really long answer, but uh, I, I could, or we could get Niels up here. Thanks, guys. Um, there are a few different ways to make a black hole. Probably. The one we best understand are how to make a black hole from a big star. And essentially what happens is you have a big star and the reason it remains big. So as we talked about, gravity takes everything and it tries to compress it and compress it and make it smaller because gravity is an attractive force. But in the interior of stars, uh, there's a nuclear reaction taking place that's 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 providing some amount of energy that's opposing that collapse that's providing pressure to prevent it from just collapsing indefinitely um and in massive stars stars that are much bigger than our own sun eventually they run out of stuff in their in their cores where this nuclear reaction is going on they run out of fuel essentially kind of like when your car runs out of gas and when it runs out of fuel, it can no longer provide that energy to support itself. And so gravity takes over and, it, and it's like, ha ha, you've run out of your opposing force and it collapses and it falls and it falls and it collapses. And for complicated reasons, there's an explosion called a supernova. And what's left over is this collapsed core of the star in the center. And that's a black hole because gravity won out. The, the opposing force basically ran out of steam. It could no longer oppose the force of gravity. And you're left with this very, very dense object where that star was. Um, and that's, that's, your, that's your black hole. So don't get too close to it. Or you won't, we won't come back out. Um, okay. We have reached the end of our, our time for tonight. Uh, thank you all for sticking around. Thank you for your excellent questions. Online audience, thank you for your questions and comments. Um, I know we didn't get to all of them, but, but uh, hopefully we, we made a dent in the bulk of the ones that you guys asked. 
Uh, these events, again, happen once a month, and we stream all of them online. Our next one, I think, is December 2nd, if that's a Friday. I'll post the information when I have a poster in the next week or so. It'll be on the Atmospheres of Galaxies, the so-called circumgalactic medium given by Dr. Irina Butsky. We also have a, a sister series of events called Astronomy on Tap that takes place at a bar in Old Town, Pasadena that happens on Monday nights. Our next one will be November 14th, the week before Thanksgiving. And for that, we will have the two, uh, the couple in the back will be our speakers, doctors and doctor, doctor and doctor Depa, um, who, who are going to talk about black holes, more about black holes, white holes, wormholes, um, and about some of the amazing discoveries that are going to be enabled by this new telescope called the Vera Rubin telescope that's coming online in the next few years. Uh, yeah, so uh, come show up, show up for that. I'm working on trying to get those live streamed online, but I haven't yet. And I think those are all of my announcements. So thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful evening and we'll see you guys again, hopefully soon.